for higher education, right? And just someone who is agile enough to meet all your admission and banking needs. We are FMA Digital. We are a leading digital marketing agency working exclusively in the higher in the education segment, right? We work with the uh, 100 plus leading universities, institutions, schools in all their uh, education, marketing, branding, lead generation, ROI needs. So uh, we are seven year old in the industry. With uh, we are headquartered in Pune, and we have delivery centers in Bangalore, Delhi, and Mumbai. These are some of the names of our esteemed clients. We we work with uh, established uh, higher education university. Institutions and universities, right? Who have in-house teams, and uh, we also work with those uh, uh, those names, reputed names, who don't have in-house teams and are looking to partner with, uh, you know, a, a trusted name who can work on work with their objectives. Uh, let's look at some of the uh, clients from the school and early education uh, zones, right? So we are working with a leading name in early education called as Learning Time. We are working with uh, Cambridge English School in Bangalore. It's a popular ICSE school. Then we are working with the first world school in Chhattisgarh. It's called Rumta International School. Then there is the American school that we are working with, uh, which is the first chain of American accredited preschools in India. Right, and there other name other names are also mentioned here. So, uh, right. So this is what we are doing essentially. We are helping. Uh, Leading universities, institutions, and schools grow leaps and bounds using the power of digital tech and marketing. We are we are working. We are providing impactful social media campaigns. We are uh, you know developing stellar websites for them. We are really good at uh, you know driving result-driven search engine optimization strategies and online reputation management campaigns. And we we have an in-house team that works with uh, you know developing powerful video stories. Uh, Focused on the top stakeholders, faculty, campus life, etc., and we have proven expertise in content marketing. These are some areas that we are working with. So we are here to help you achieve all your marketing and branding goals in the new normal. So consider as us as your trusted partner in the journey, and we are happy to give a complimentary audit to all the panelists today and also to the audience members. Who are participating today? So uh, you know, please, uh, my team will be in touch with all of you to uh, you know check who is how we can get started with the complimentary audit, whether it is for online reputation check or website or SEO analysis or your social media analysis. We will be happy to provide them. This is my final slide. Uh, which of your top marketing challenges can be solved? Please give us an opportunity. You will be very happy with what we have to offer to you. Thank you so much. And over to you, Chandan.
with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the panel speakers, uh, Mr. Rajesh Vasudevan, who is the head of schools, Manchester International School, Koyamati. He will be moderating this session for the day. Welcome, Rajesh, sir. We have Mr. Gyan Kutiyavis, he is the head of schools, Rodia International Center for Learning from Mumbai. Welcome, Gyan. Ms. Yashmi Madhwani, she is the head of schools, Yamna, Yamna Bain Plasi International Schools from Mumbai. Sudhar Boyan, she is the school director, Scottish High International School from Gurgaon. Anvita, uh, principal, Kandor International School, Bangalore. I am again happy to see you, Chandrasekhar sir. He is the CEO of Jan Group of Schools, Bangalore. So, without wasting much time, my, uh, you know, uh, uh, my, uh, my invitation to all of you and uh, over to you, Rajesh sir, please moderate this. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chandan, for this uh, wonderful opportunity that you are giving us. Uh, though uh, since March, uh, this is what most of the heads of schools and the management have been doing for quite some time. Uh, which otherwise, I think, I, thanks to COVID-19 or the pandemic, with some evils come some good things. So, you know, this has brought, uh, uh, narrowed down the walls uh, to a larger extent. and. Um, making things possible to look uh, at learning or education from a different perspective altogether. So a very good good evening to all of you here. Uh, in fact, I, before, as a formality, uh, as a moderator for the session, I would uh, uh, like to introduce the panelists uh, for the session. Uh, Chandrasekhar Deep is the CEO of Jane School, uh, Jane Group of Schools, Bangalore, with 18 years of experience in the education space and phase, I should say. And you've also been awarded as the youngest um, young educationer, uh, educationist, uh, you know, in rising star of education, awarded by the Education World in 2017. Uh, so welcome, Judge Shiger on board. Uh, I'm happy to have you with us. Uh, Sudha Goyal, Director, Scottish uh, High. Um, from, you know, she comes with, with across the curriculum expertise. That is that's the beauty of the whole thing, you know. Uh, when we talk about international schools, we feel that international school administrators are stuck to international education. But uh, the reality is that we, basic education has started with state board and then we have traveled across the, uh, you know, the curriculum and have come here. So, Sudha, a warm welcome to you as well. Uh, and with Gupta, you're not, uh, though probably, I think we haven't met a uh, person, but then we have spoken a couple of times. So, um, head of, uh, principal of, um, Candor International School in Bangalore, a warm welcome to you and Vinita to the session. Uh, Jamna Varnarsi is being steered by a very dynamic uh, head of school, Jasmine Rani, a warm welcome to you, ma'am. And with 37 years of experience in different scenario in learning and teach teaching and learning, we have Ian Davis, head of school of Garodia International Center for Learning, Mumbai. I think the quorum completes with people from across the spectrum of international education, representing different dimensions of it. So without much delay, I think we should kickstart uh, with uh, what we are supposed to be doing this afternoon. Uh, and once again, um, a warm welcome to all the panelists and all the attendees here. I was just listening to Saura when he was uh, talking, making his presentation. He said, uh, new normal means new uh, opportunities. So that's where we have to start with. I feel that bigger the challenge is, bigger the opportunities for growth. COVID-19 has definitely challenged all of us. Irrespective of the size of the school, irrespective of the nature of the school, the anatomy of the school, uh, across the country, outside as well. What we thought wouldn't happen prior to 24th March 2020, Learning, teaching and learning, education per se has seen an enormous leap in terms of digital learning. By, um, having said that, on one hand we have the faculty and the students trying to cope with the emotional and the mental, and I would also say the spiritual balance. A spiritual has got nothing to do with religion, spiritual in terms of learning. The spirituality of learning when the, when the faculty and the students and the schools in larger uh, at large are trying to uh, navigate the process 
On the other hand, we have the parents, a lot of apprehensions, a lot of anxiety uh, as to, you know, for them, education will culminate with assessments and examination results and university entrances. To this. Teachers, again, it comes back to teachers and the school and, uh, as to how and when are we going to meet the students on campus? How are we going to manage the syllabus? COVID-19 has changed everything around us. Some things for good, some things for bad. I remember, uh, this is, I would like to call it as a renaissance of the 21st century education. I would like to start with this question to Ryan Davis. How do you view this new normal as an opportunity, as a challenge? And how do you see the post-COVID education system in India, keeping in mind your international experience? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. Um, quite, a, quite a huge topic, and I'll try to be as brief as I can so that everyone can have a good um, say in the matter. Um, I actually think that I would wrap COVID with also up with the, um, the recent NEP from the Indian government. <clears throat> I certainly see that there has been a groundswell and almost the potential for revolutionary change in India um, with the emphases and the principles behind the new NEP, particularly with the move away from rote learning, with the move all towards critical thinking, creativity, with a huge emphasis on conceptual understanding and the ability to use information rather than just repeat um, information dictated from the teacher um, with an emphasis less on the exam system but more on building the profile and recognizing the individual strengths and qualities of every single um, student that there is. Now COVID has added to that because I think that Indian parents, when I speak to them, are far more aware that out of COVID must come new opportunities. And the international curriculums, I think, blend beautifully into the uh, potentials that the um, Indian government are looking for, particularly in early years education, by the way. I think that's where um, everything will start. And I think that's where the impact will be biggest. Um, so how can an international board respond? Well, I think to answer your question, it, it already has. The international boards are already doing exactly what uh, the NEP is looking for. They're already flexible enough to deal with each student, whatever their strengths are, whether it might be music, whether it might be theatre, whether it's maths, whether it's science. Um, the international boards allow all of those specialities. But on top of that, they expect other things, which I think are very important, like service learning, the ethics and values and the moralities of being a human being are intrinsically linked to the international programs that we offer in our schools. And I hope out of the um, COVID situation, um, irrespective of online learning, we're actually going to get a greater emphasis on the well-being and the elements of learning that are not necessarily academic, but the social skills, the human skills, the capabilities of people to collaborate, to work together, to work in teams, but also to take risks, not to jump off a cliff, but to take risks for their thinking, to take risks with what they do, so that they're not always worried about giving right answers, but realizing now that out of sensible mistakes, progress and creativity can come. So I will, without being too specific, I think the international boards 
already have that balance, already have that flexibility. And I would hope that um, Indian State Board schools are, are very forward in coming to international schools and saying, how can we work together? How can we partner? Because one of the biggest things is going to be teacher training in this area. And there's a heck of a lot of um, good practice going on in many, many schools that we can share um, without any cost and we can share without any competitive element between schools so that the benefit of the students come first. And that's how it should be. Greater cooperation between schools, greater collaboration between professionals and um, schools that work as colleagues. So it sounds very grand, but I think that's it. COVID, by the way, just to finish, I think to me has emphasized even more the importance of human beings. What we're suffering from online learning is the human touch. Some people will argue strongly that it's opened new horizons for people through technology. Yeah, you know, but that's in a small way. What is really lacking and what everyone is craving is for that teacher as a human being to work with young people. And that's why we mustn't devalue our teachers in the schools. We've got to do everything we can to build them up and to give them the support they need to take the future forward. Thank you. Thank you, and that was a, a, a very specific and detailed uh, um, uh, you know, perspective on um, on the entire scenario that all the schools across the world uh, are facing through. Um, so having said that, I would like to hear from Ms. Uh, Jasmine and as to what is her take on this uh, situation that we are in, and how do you see the new normal? Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, sharing uh, our perspective uh, on COVID situation and uh, way forward from here. Uh, as uh, Ian already mentioned that some of these areas are integrated into the international curriculum already what we uh, in the school are running. Uh, but most importantly, what uh, when it comes to the students and uh, uh, what we spoke about, human touch. So when when lockdown was declared, the first thing came in our mind was that well, how do we now give the same experience so that there is less impact on students' well-being. So that was the first area which uh, we had to uh, look into and uh, starting with uh, that as a vision that uh, we want to give the same experience as well as taking care of that students are no more going to be in the classroom and of course balancing the academics. So uh, as, as leaders, yes, those are the challenges what were put forward due to COVID, I would say. Um, I would say uh, the situation when you look at the team going through this for many, many months now, uh, definitely I feel that the adaptability and the flexibility what I could see in the entire team. And when I talk about uh, entire team or shall I say all stakeholders, including students, parents, teachers, and of course, uh, the other uh, leaders running the program. So everyone was uh, looking at, okay, cooperation was one, collaboratively coming forward, sharing best practices among teachers, and then, okay, this worked very well in online uh, platform, and they all sort of are supporting and still supporting and moving forward. So if I uh, look at a lot to learn from this uh, last few months uh, from the entire team, and it all happened because of uh, everyone coming together. So once you decide on that, well-being of the student and how do you support that, I think the things do work uh, uh, wonderfully. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Ms. Jasmine, for that. Now, uh, interesting is that, you know, we are talking about human touch, which Ms. Ian Davis and Ms. Jasmine has come in, have been talking about it, and I think they have come to an agreement saying that, yes, 
there's no absence of humanity, irrespective of the fact that, that we are being separated by the virtual divide. So, Mr. Santoshaker, uh, now um, we normally uh, talk about the volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous world, and we say that that is, the, that is what is education all about, preparing children for the VUCA world. As the CEO of Jane Group of Schools, what is that you have to say about this? Uh, preparing children or education as a preparation of life itself. Good afternoon and uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on this forum, sharing uh, learning from all people on the panel and the attendees. Now, coming specifically to the question, well, I I always have this belief that uh, children are unaffected by the VUCA world because they make the VUCA in the world. So they are the people who are at the center of the universe, if we call it, especially in education institutions. So if uh, we talk about technology, they are technology natives. If you talk about uh, innovation, they are always green innovation, everything they do. But one thing which I would like to say here at the outset is with the pandemic, the one thing which has happened across is the world has got into an accelerated there is a kind of a crash course which is going on for everyone in every dimension and discipline. People who did business are now reinventing their new business models and questioning what in the first place were they doing before Jan 2020. People like me who used to travel 12 to 13 days in a month visiting schools and institutions across the country are wondering as to why did we even do that kind of travel when things could have happened technology and let me tell you this the school buildings might have got closed the institutions might have been shut but learning has not stopped it's okay. in fact it is much more than what it used to be in fact back in the days we used to wonder why can't children connect with teachers somewhere around 7 7 30 in the evening so that that's the time when they sit down to prepare their homework or their assignments and they have some doubts when they sit down to solve some problems or issues you should have the opportunity with your teachers and get that doubt clarified because that learning is more amplified than classroom learning. Yes, Today, that is the normal. People are calling their teachers or dialing their teachers at their requirement and teachers are happy to help. So, coming back to the question what you said, as in this VUCA world, what has happened? The teachers, the schools, the models have become very, very flexible. It's adapting and that's the best thing. And children, for the right reasons, are in the driving seat. They are now saying that this is how it is, this is what we want to do, and this is how we want to learn. Now come on, give us information, give us knowledge, and let's collaborate and let's work. So all those training room lectures and models are now in your living room. So that's the best thing I would like to look at in an optimistic way in the given Maybe going forward, we can talk about the issues and challenges, but I would like to stop here and say, VUCA world was always there, but now it's more into our lives than just a theoretical concept. Thank you, Chandrasekhar. That was well put, uh, you know, about uh, the, 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 the anxiety or the apprehension uh, all of us had, and, you know, and especially as people in the field of education, not cross of teaching and learning, uh, the apprehension is one that drives us for innovation. You know, like we always think about how do we uh, improve from this to the next. And um, so thank you for that wonderful thought on uh, I mean, sharing uh, with the, the, the wonderful thought with all of this. Ms. Sudha Goel, being the school director, there's a huge responsibility, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, situations like this. Um, one On one side, you have, you need to um, navigate your team, and then you need to keep your students, uh, you know, I mean, the, the mental makeup, the, the mindset right for the learning. And then you have these parents with never ending questions. How do you, as a director, uh, deal, cope with this situation? And what is that you have in store for them uh, when you, if, you know, if all things go well and we are able to open the school in a couple of months from now? Mr. 
Sorry. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Some of you we have been we have met almost a year back. It seems so long now. It's so nice to see everybody and meeting. And uh, I would like to start this whole discussion by actually commending the efforts of teachers and students as well as their parents and the way everybody has come up, come together to deal with the situation which we never thought it was going to be. The way the teachers have uh, learned in a day's time or maybe in two, three, four days how they have changed from face-to-face uh, you know, -face teachers to an online expert tutors uh, which Till this pandemic was the, came in or set in, we were not used to. We never thought that our teachers, our Hindi teacher, our mathematics teacher would be able to do such things. It is amazing how these kind of situations when we face, we come up to come up and we do overcome all these and become expert in these things and we learn. That shows that we are lifelong learners. That each one of us, we are lifelong learners and we learn every day. And uh, like you said, my school is not only an IB school, it also offers, I'm the school director, so I have ICSC, I have PYP, I have Cambridge, I have IB diploma program. So yes, we have to manage all the curriculum and each curriculum is different from the other. And definitely, uh, when it comes to online, I think somewhere the whole curriculum have come in a similar manner. You are uh, using a lot of technology. While using technology, we have also kept in mind uh, the mental and physical well-being, emotional well-being of children. We have been trying to connect with the parents through of our counselors so that you know, uh, because we know that there's a, there's a human touch which is missing, that whole idea of children coming to school, it's, it's, it's a great thing that the uh, everything has come to our uh, drawing room or in our studies, in our studies individually. But that coming to school, meeting your friends, talking, gossiping, you know, being naughty, hiding behind somewhere, you know, teachers scolding you, practicing. All those things are missing, so we are trying to do that along with teaching, maybe a lot of competitions, online activities. So we have changed STEM to STEAM. Where ST is there, we have also added A to it so that we have, we have uh, you know, infused a lot of activities where children themselves are participating and ensuring uh, that they, they are uh, kept entertained also and not only online and, and also exams like an IB diploma program very soon we will be starting with mock exams and you know all those things have to happen online and the children are learning how to appear online examination which used to be only I think uh, when these uh, other online SAT and other things were happening now it is it has become a normal thing for us. So yes, we are trying to deal with all these things and also ensuring that the parents, there is a connect with the parents, the teachers, we ensure that the teachers are talking to the parents every week. We are ensuring that children, one-to-one -one conversation with children, counselors taking sessions. So all these things together I'm trying and my principals are helping me in that and, and the way the teachers have uh, come up and coming together, collaborating and working towards this. I think it is going to be, it, it's a great thing that has happened and it is going to be a part and parcel of post-COVID time also. Because uh, along with one face-to-face, -face, I think online teaching and learning and connect with the parents and the children is going to be a normal way. It is not going to come to an end so suddenly that one day suddenly we start having face to face. So definitely it is going to be a blended learning where we are going to have 
what right to sue as well as the case to pay. Like the government has in Haryana at least they have asked us that we can open school and but with consent and online teaching to continue. So that is a blended learning and teaching where you have to if the children come you have to take face to face classes. Plus, you have to also have online classes. So yes, it's a huge task for us, us, and we are trying to make a balance between all these. Thank you, Mr. Dr. for that wonderful insight on this. Uh, I'm, I'm Ms. Anvita, like uh, we are in the disruptive uh, change. We are seeing disruptive changes in education, and I, as I said in the beginning, like we are witnessing the 21st century version of uh, the, the renaissance, the educational renaissance. How, as a school leader, do you, um, are you planning to capitalize on the disruptions that are happening around us? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and hello, everybody. It's good to be on this uh, forum and listening to everyone. Uh, I think the advantage from the disruption has already happened. I must say that when we started, you know, we, we closed the school on the 13th of March, I still remember, and at that time, uh, disruption was absolutely at its peak with teachers not knowing how to, you know, go ahead with it, do things. And then, um, slowly and steadily, we have all evolved. In fact, very quickly, we have all evolved into, uh, into beings that are very comfortable with technology. Some of our teachers who actually went and locked themselves in their houses for three days and could not be found, are now almost the cheerleaders for technology. So uh, while COVID has been one of the, uh, probably one of the worst phases uh, for humanity in many more ways, in more ways than one, but if we look at the positive side of it, we have been thrown into technology and we have used it very well. So I do believe that when... Uh, the learning that we have had from this disruption is going to change the face of education when we when we start school. Uh, for example, you know the kind of uh, challenges that have been thrown at us, and I'm sure at each uh, school in, uh, that has been in this, we've come up with solutions for that. Now, some of the things, for example, that one of the big challenge was that the students weren't used to, there was screen time challenge uh, for the students, there was a cha challenge of isolation, suddenly the students who could go out and play were not allowed to do that because of uh, the fear of infection um, and uh, so we as schools, we have had the responsibility to create a balance, a well-being balance among the students. The teachers were coping with their own uh, challenges at that time. But what we did was we came up with uh, regular classes in mindfulness, which is not, which is something that, you know, we were wanting to do for the longest. And in a school, something or the other kept happening, we couldn't do that. But this gave us, the, this disruption gave us the opportunity to do that. Uh, we needed to make sure that our students get involved with each other and school despite being uh, behind the screen and sitting alone and looking at the faces. So what we did was that we have in a very big way, given, you know, we wanted, always wanted our student council to partly run the school. And this has been a great opportunity for us. So our student council is so active because these are the senior children. They understand the needs. They themselves are looking forward to, you know, being in school. So our student council is almost running a parallel activity center for the students. And they send mails. And that is, I think that's a big, uh, big plus that has and it is something that is going to help the students moving to the next level to the 21st century. Uh, we made sure that the whole school has assemblies. So uh, the students who did not attend assembly earlier, I see them on screen now. I see teachers on screen because they are so parched and they are so desperate to be with each other. And, uh, you know, we had to first almost go on rounds to see that is everybody in the assembly hall. Now they are the first to come on and log in and you know, they are so excited about it. They connect with teachers a lot more. Uh, we are working with smaller groups 
uh, we have this we have the student counselor the uh, who stepped in in a big way into the school and he has connected with students students are able to connect with her so i would say that all this is really the positive that has come out of this disruption and when we open school we will uh, definitely use all of this and i do believe very strongly that despite the fact that we were very nervous when this whole thing started we didn't know how we're going to do the curriculum how will we train but collaboration has increased many fold collaboration not only among the teachers but the students and the teachers uh, the heads the coordinators i do think that we are far more uh, involved with each other than we were even when the physical school was there i'm not taking away the the value of physical school and the and the fact that we are all desperately looking forward to coming back to school i have students calling me and saying can we come for a walk to school because they're so missing it i also think the students have got and realized the value of school this time when they come back they're going to be a different lot <laughs> Thank you so much for that, uh, Anvita. Now, it was interesting to listen to all of you on the first uh, the round of this discussion as to how we see the disruption around us and how we have evolved as schools and administrators. Having said that, um, it is not always a bed of roses. You know, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, it's not going to disappear. The COVID-19 is not just going to disappear overnight and next morning we are go not going to read it in the news. people that you no know, you don't have to have vaccine the covid has is disappeared from the planet earth and you all can get back to normal you know that's not going to happen it's here to stay for some more time um giving the 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 as you said you know not discounting the 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 significance of the physical infrastructure for the school learning has taken uh, a different anatomy in different uh, sites altogether how have uh, schools in general and your school or group of schools especially have navigated the curriculum or the syllabus to adopt digital in, uh, learning into the into, into the scenario for example what i'm trying to say is until march when we had the unit plans or the lesson plans or when we had the curriculum designed for the students we never thought as you said none of us um, even you know, the weirdest dreams thought that we will be sitting in the row in our comfort zone and call home and then lessons happen from individual spectrum so you know we never thought something like that but having really equipped ourselves all the schools to be i mean on a on a um, keeping the integrity of uh, of the profession are we really equipped to handle um, the you know the new mode of learning for the students how much of a curriculum navigation has happened within the schools how much have schools invested on teachers i'm not sure that all, whether all the teachers were uh, digitally equipped to handle the disruption in you know, the classes so schools would have definitely would have to invest a lot on the teachers per se so these are the different questions uh, different points that we'll be discussing i would like to uh, start with chandan uh, on this as a ceo of a group of schools how much of teacher investment has happened to equip them to handle this uh, this disruption so i think uh, i would like to be very candid and uh, frank here on this conversation uh, not in a, i'm talking for myself when i say uh, how much of uh, teacher investment has happened in training i personally feel we are not able to do enough Uh, and i have a little bit of a background to that uh, because uh, it's like this right you know when the ship is moving there's only that much you can kind of uh, maintain it or you can service it i do this say this because march 17th if i'm not wrong we started getting the notification that uh, there will be a month long uh, shutdown the school right. will shut down till the end of march 31st and eventually it went on and now it's 6 months plus and it's never opened Now, why am I giving this context? Is at that time we were kind of confused because March month is the month where there is admissions, there is assessments, there is exams, and there are a lot of other things. Now we were immediately looking at uh, you know extinguishing that fire. Like how do we handle all of that in a safe manner? Now April it kind of dawned on us that this is going to be the way for at least next two three months when the lockdown nationwide was announced. 
So what we did was we definitely made some amendments and we said, okay, all teachers will go through a compulsory one uh, month long the training where every afternoon for two hours to three hours they will be equipped with the digital skills. So kind of, uh, I mean, I, and I, I echo the words of uh, Ms. Suda here, I have tremendous respect to all the teachers and the teaching fraternity because I know for some time some of the teachers were scared to even open an email account. Today they have a Google classroom. So the kind of uh, you know change which I saw coming in in that 30 days was amazing in the month of April. But having said that, why did I say that not enough is after April, we are kind of constantly reinventing a lot of things like the new curriculum, the size down curriculum came into picture, then we started completing that syllabus and uh, engaging with parents and as a group, we operate in different geographies. We don't sit only in Mumbai or Bangalore or Hyderabad. We have schools in Nagpur, in Aurangabad, in rural Karnataka. Now, access, equity, electricity, internet, network, technology, all of these has been different challenges. So, not one formula fits all. Some of the teachers, even to this day, seven months into the pandemic, teachers are still conducting their classes on their smartphone. Right? So, it's, it's really different thing. So, when you say, have we done enough to train them? No, because you need to really equip them and not one size fits all. But, the fact is, we have definitely as a group taken some bold decisions. We have given complete autonomy to the teacher to say, if, I mean, technology is one answer, but if you think you can still take care of your children, because some of the people in the rural places, they are all in the same vicinity. So, a teacher can always sit in the open ground and children. So, we have given that freedom also to teachers saying that go ahead and do that. We have even sponsored sanitizer kits, masks and other things. Because at the end of the day, the total vision is learning should not stop, no matter how. But at the end of the day, everybody needs to be safe and secure. So, these are different things which we are trying to do. But, maybe it's a great eye-opener. Once the situation goes back near to normalcy, there is a vaccine out there, then we know where we need to put our training budget and what are those things which we need to really work on hand holding. Excellent, Mr. Ryan Davis, uh, what is your take on this? Like, uh, we're talking about teaching lesson, yes. Yeah, um, I, I think that I, I speak from ignorance in compared to the previous speaker because um, I'm in, in Mumbai. Um, I'm very fortunate that we have a fully operational uh, teaching full sound student one-to-one -one lap, laptop, etc. So moving um, online has, has not been a problem for us. Um, and I understand that that's very dif different um, to the majority of people around the country, and I respect that. Um, that said, um, we, we, had to, we, we had to train our teachers, of course. We had to train our teachers in the nuances of how we want them to be going and working online because it would have terrified me if we'd have gone online and we have just had teachers standing in front of a, a screen with or just using a PowerPoint and saying copy this, do this, almost like a teacher in front of the classroom telling the students, you know, by rote learning. So we've had, we've, we've done an enormous amount of training with our staff on sharing good practice on how to make technology interactive. With the students, how so that means that with, with our learning, our leaders in learning in the school, they've created um, training not just for the staff but also for the students about how they should be acting online, for example, how they should be engaging online. Simple things like to students, keep your cameras on, don't you know, shut them down because that's impolite. Um, things like when to turn off your mic and. A whole range of things, but how to use um, groups, discussion, how to give respect to other people, how to use your hands online, you know, and it, it sounds silly and simplistic, but really very important in terms of te using the online as the new classroom, but using the, the online new classroom to deliver quite, um, I think, upfront um, learning understanding. We didn't want to return to the easy option, which is just open your book of this chapter and we'll follow it through and we'll have a test. We, that's, we don't want that at all. 
We want, so what it's meant is that all of our staff, myself included, we've, we've, we've rewritten all about how it is to teach. We've completely rewritten how we operate it. And that's why I take my hat off to the staff, because I think the online has been even more of a, of a problem for teachers in terms of physical and fitness and in terms of just being able to have the um, ability to go for so many hours a day um, and teaching and maintaining um, such a high level of um, professionalism for so long. Um, so we had to be very adaptive. We, we have at the end of every week sessions where we have teachers, let's let, you know, the online opens up new opportunities. So we've had more and more teachers going into peer observation where there were other teachers operating. So when, when we've had one teacher who's really good at using questioning online, we've given them other teachers and one by one they've gone and observed them online. Much easier than physically going, you know, walking the other side of the school to see them. We've had um, them developing much more um, innovative curriculum links. Um, even to the extent of um, experiments, you know, the laboratories, and we're a very heavily experimental school, and we have to make up some of that time. But we've still tried to maintain that. I mean, even the orchestra still meets playing online, um, and so you can do it if you try. But we're lucky. We we have, you know, capable teachers with technology already at that level. So I I am blessed, and even so. It's been difficult for us, and we, we have had to tweak and learn and share regularly what we're doing to, to teach in a new way. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. It does mean like having said, listen to everyone from the, um, the Nobai, like, you know, finally, I'm, this is for all three of you who are interesting. I want you to look into this, like, uh, when we're talking about investing on teachers, this, this um, potential uh, thing that we are missing is, the teachers develop in the staff rooms. You know, uh, teachers develop, even the students have developed in the classrooms, teachers develop in the staff rooms, uh, uh, you know, collaborating. So for me, collaborating is, uh, collaboration is to, uh, you know, agree to, uh, agree with people who you, you, we don't want to agree with. You know, so that uh, skills are missing in teaching. And everybody, everybody is trying to put out the best in front of the camera, even the students and the parents and the teachers across. How do you, Ms. Jasmine, and uh, you know, trying to make sure that the skills that the children should pick up, the social skills, the behavioral skills, which they are missing out at this point of time because being at home in isolation, how are the collaborative practices being handled for both teachers and students? Uh, so thank you for uh, asking that. How collaborative, uh, you know, activities are handled. Uh, if I if I look at uh, everything is happening even now in the virtual spaces. So when we talk about training the teachers in outside the staff room, uh, we said that okay, let's quickly make the WhatsApp group among all the teachers and something you have done which has worked very well. The teacher puts it up on that WhatsApp and everybody is learning uh, from there. Uh, yes, uh, as we are talking about, human touch is missing, no doubt in that. But then the virtual space is open for the teachers. Uh, we run online Zoom classes and uh, again, fortunate that our school is in Mumbai city where you know we are, we don't have other challenges and the, our staff as well as you know our students have their uh, devices and not just one multiple devices so to conduct those things become more easy uh, our uh, training was focusing uh, yes how to engage students into uh, those lessons uh, where uh, what you had mentioned we don't want to run the powerpoint one after the other so how do you engage them uh, some of our teachers, they start the lesson uh, with the meditation of two minutes, three minutes to calm everyone down because suddenly, you know, uh, you see your classmates over there. So you have to define the rules again uh, for the virtual classrooms and uh, teachers to calm them uh, would do good for collaboration, take, through, uh, take them through the different uh, breakout rooms 
and then teacher is going from one to the other uh, room to have, have a look at that what children are doing in, the, uh, in those sessions. So for uh, teachers as well as uh, students, I would say collaboration has happened in that way. Uh, encourage something that, I mean, we don't have any other option, but do virtually, so this is what uh, is going on. And uh, even uh, for the parents, uh, I feel that uh, we had to even educate them that uh, this is a personal space between teacher and a student, and uh, we want you all to step behind and leave them and enjoy those activities happening in the class. Okay, thank you, Jasmine, for that. Now, uh, Amita, like, why do you say that uh, when, we're, uh, when we're talking about um, the disruptions and the challenges that, uh, that have come across and how we are navigating uh, very successfully um, uh, when, in that direction, the blended learning comes across as a silver lining. You know, like now we know that when we plan the next year's academic year, 2021, 2021 is so 21, 22, for the next academic year, if you're going to plan uh, the, the curriculum or the lesson plan, what new uh, are you going to add into the into your lesson plan into the curriculum um, if to uh, keeping in mind the post pandemic situation yes uh, definitely uh, like i said in my previous uh, you know little bit that we will be looking at uh, technology technology is certainly going to play a very important role the teachers too are now leading on technology they will not replace the, uh, the physical touch. Now, one of the things that we have done during this time is, you know, I'm actually quite excited to see what it's going to look like when we reopen school. The first thing really that comes to my mind when we reopen school is something that you said just a while ago, that it's COVID is not going to go away. So I think what is really on top of my mind when you talk about reopening school, the physical school, is the safety and security of students. I think that is something that we all are, are a little worried about, are looking at, are running, uh, are running some protocols, are running some systems in school to see uh, how it's going to be when the students come, how this uh, not only blended, but this hybrid system will, because we will have to have students in school, we will have to have uh, online learning going on, you know, uh, yes, the government is going to let us open schools, but there are parents who are not happy to send their children to school till the vaccine comes out. Even when the vaccine comes out, it's not like one day we wake up and we say we are safe. For people to get a vaccine, it's going to take time. Now, what has happened is really when we reopen school, I think um, it's going to look very different because one of the things that I would like to mention here that we all have done is our policies look so different now. I don't know how many of us have worked, but a lot of us have worked on our IT policy, on our safety policy, on our online policy, library, libraries, you know, are now digital. So uh, I would say that we would use all this good that has happened, all these students uh, who are taking the lead, the teachers who are, for example, uh, before this we would have, we would always struggle to collaborate and collaboration is so important. Not, I mean, I also totally, I've always said that the teachers are the warriors during this time, the unsung warriors, because we've spoken of nurses, we've spoken of doctors, but the kind of work the teachers are, have done, which is mostly women, um, they have had to run their houses and do all of that. So coming back to schools, but um, we would struggle to collaborate, as I was saying, and now the, we collaborate on a daily basis. So the time that the teachers were using, uh, travel back home is being used for collaboration. So I think time management has increased multifold in this whole situation. I do see that when the schools reopen it every which way, whether it is uh, learning, uh, holding blended classes, holding online PTSDs, changing our lesson plans in a manner that a teacher is not just uh, leaning on one green source which is the whiteboard or something. For example, in our school, we've got interactive boards. So the teachers will come and they'll be using a lot of technology even there. The lesson plans, you will definitely need to look different. And I doubt if the teachers can also mentally go back to the old ways of functioning. 
you know, and that's exactly the point to us. You know, just to add on to this. So when teachers come back, you know, they're coming back better equipped. You know, for the six seven months, they're better equipped, even the students. So I don't think uh, schools can still manage with the textbook, you know, the kind of scenario that was uh, six months ago. I think that they, we have to move forward with the new, and the teachers will have to be supplied with that kind of resources. So thank you, Amitabh, for that point. I'm just moving on to Ms. Sudha. How, do you, how are you going to face the new uh, animal called the new teachers and the new students in your school uh, post COVID? Okay, uh, yeah, of course, they are going to be totally changed to teachers and uh, totally changed students. Definitely, when we were talking about uh, teachers' development, uh, we have not talked about Microsoft Teams, which is something very difficult for teachers to learn. But I am so glad to see the teachers who have learned and also the parents, because it had to be taught to the parents and the children how to work on Microsoft Teams. Zoom is much easier than uh, working on Microsoft team. But yes, I think the, our biggest budget will be on training teachers uh, as well as our lesson plan. Like everybody else said that lesson plan is going to have a lot of technology being used and defin uh, definitely a much better technologically trained teachers as well as children. The only thing I think we will have to teach our children to again come back and have that human touch which they have been missing all these uh, almost a school year uh, in, uh, in Gurgaon at least in our side the school starts from April onwards so we are almost coming to an end of the session and by Ma February March everybody is going to have their uh, annual exams and the session so almost a session has gone without coming to the school so definitely especially the children who are in nursery who are in grade one who are going to come for, they have missed one whole year of school and they don't even know what the school feels like it is going to be a new nursery no new kg new grade one new grade two especially no new grade 11 who have no experience of coming to school and sitting with children and actually talking to the teachers or in uh, on like face to face these nursery children who are there they have not even seen their teachers face to face they have not they have only seen them on screen it's like tv for them especially the smaller children definitely they're going to be a different lot and it has to be a different way of treating them maybe as as if they have just joined the school and they have to be taught how to be in class, how to be outside class because they have all been in, at home uh, all this while. Yeah. So yeah. One, ready think, for that. We have another 10 minutes to take the questions from the audience. But then before that, I just want to, uh, each one of you take uh, around 30 seconds to uh, one minute. To just, uh, there's no one touch solution to anything, uh, you know, in the new scenario, but then. What is, I mean, we are, we are, why we are speaking about so many things that are, we haven't, um, you know, the, the assessment, the assignments, the labs, uh, all these things are missing uh, in, the, in, the, in the scenario. Um, uh, so schools definitely will have to look into it. If the online classes continue to stay here for another three months, how are we going to do that? So, Mr. Shaker, I mean, uh, how, how is that, uh, you will your, be, you know, what is the, uh, the one quick uh, answer to this is how are we going to handle the non-classroom uh, activities for the students? Well, I think uh, the way we are handling, I don't have a magic formula to it, but I'll tell you what exactly we are doing. We are trying to go with the flow. When I say we are trying to go with the flow, have the bigger plan in mind that students or children need engagement. Uh, as adults, we are all confined to our four walls, we are all doors. But that can be do with alternatives like technology and other things, but a child activity. A child needs engagement. So what we are trying to do in our school is we are trying to help children understand and cope up with the new normal by creating opportunities. So for example, we have got these uh, two hours between 4.30 in the evening to 6.30 where they can kind of tune into any of our classes through the Zoom and through Google 
classroom which are non academic when i say non academic there is art there is music there is dance there is zumba there is uh, some stretching yoga and other things where they can kind of it's like a summer camp it's a, it's a ongoing summer camp for short for people where anybody can log in and we try to create them into breakout rooms and we give them that kind of uh, hand holding and we also know like there are some observers in those classrooms where some children just log in tune in they don't do anything they just tune in and then they just stay quiet so there are uh, our observers who will reach out to them later and try to help with them so okay. these are things which we are trying to do apart from the organized uh, timetable schedule plan but yes there are options which we are still exploring for lab uh, was all to bahut hi yahan but as of now this is what it is thank you so much I think um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, just one minute. Uh, if you can spend up, I mean, about thirty seconds on this. Ah, me, both. Labor or not? Um, can we mute? Uh, Mr. Sanjeev, I guess uh, can you please mute the mic? There is such a noise. Mr. Okay. So over to you, Mr. Sudha. Like, what do you see? How how are you going to handle this? and uh, the assignments assessments in particular examination the fear of examination i think that that the children are now you know like they're getting used to this uh, exams from google classrooms and technology in uh, exam.net uh, yeah so how i mean coming back to the real pen pen and paper test i mean uh, when the school reopens how do you think how do you how, how are you going to uh, handle this yeah as of now as of now what we have done is we started with grade 9 10 11 12 Yeah, just papers and then they're scanning them and uh, sending us back to us and we correct them and send it back to them and then have PTM. So with nine to twelve, we are trying to do that. Six to eight. After that, we will start with six to eight. Before March, we will definitely have a mock exam for them. Train them to sit for three hours and write. And of course, till grade five, we don't have any exams, so we have continuous assessments. Those are conducted on exam dot net. as you know multiple question on the remote so it is slowly it will have to happen like that and we are trying to do that i think the time is over at the other session but i already talked uh, but uh, we have two more minutes i think it's and uh, how much time is left with us uh, because i have taken your questions so you have one to four to five minutes so um ms anvita uh, coming back to you Uh, I mean, uh, to all of us, you know, like here, uh, uh, the international schools were better equipped uh, in terms of many things because you know uh, there are certain uh, certain expectations as to when a child is uh, you know uh, put into an international education. But they see that the digital class, uh, I mean, online, um, the blended learning, the flipped learning, and that has always been part of our uh, scenario. But then uh, assessments have never changed, even you know, uh, unless it's for MIT. It's going to be e-assessment. Just so all the exams are going to be you know pen and paper. So how do you see it in your school? Uh, the children that as we approach another term uh, coming to the last lap of it, how do you see assessments happening? Yeah, so yes, you're absolutely correct. The assessment is something that is so important, and uh, um, even we in the PYP, of course, in the primary years, we don't have an issue of that. And, But in the senior classes, the classes that are going to take the board exams, those board exams are going to be taken by everybody around the world, and that's not changing. So yes, that is one of our concerns, and we are looking at different ways of doing it. Till now, what we have done is that we are using different tools like Exam Not Dot In and others, and we are trying to create work with the students in smaller groups so that it is a security type kind of an examination. So right now, that's what we are doing. But moving forward, you know, for the students to come and sit in a in an examination hall and work with a pen and paper, quite honestly, we are hoping that we will get some kind of a you know a, a flexibility by the Karnataka government also, and we will be allowed to call uh, students because that's as of now, of course, we are doing everything online that we can. But moving forward, if we have to give the students a real time, you know, with the posters and with all the you know things that. Are required by the IB and the CAIB and all. So we are hoping and we are looking that in case we do get some kind of flexibility, we will look at calling students to school in smaller groups, keeping all the safety security measures and not call them all. 
Yes, the teachers will again have to work a lot harder because they'll have to create that many more papers. You can't have the same papers with different groups. But that is something that we are looking at. And I guess, you know, we've already worked so hard this year as a school community. And we will continue to do that. We will, we are hoping in case that doesn't happen, we will have to find another way to do this and give our students the mocks and the midterms and all of that that they need to do to be able to be successful in the final board exam. So we have four board classes, so we are looking at it very closely. Very closely. Thank you so much for that wonderful insight on the post-pandemic uh, uh, school scenario and the current scenario. Uh, you know, uh, I would like to call this a balance in balance, new normal, and the new education policy. I think we are going to blend all these things together into a wonderful package. And I think as, as all men, like all of you, even I am as a head of school, you know, like very excited to uh, have this new scenario you know, for teaching and learning. Uh, I thank all of you for all this wonderful insight that you have shared with us. Uh, in fact, I, I, I really wanted to talk about the national education policy, but personally, I feel that the new uh, education policy is nothing but the international curriculum wrapped up in a different package altogether, which the international schools have been doing for quite some time, the critical thinking, collaborative planning, all these things. So I mean, I don't, uh, I really didn't want to invest this added time on uh, discussing national education policy, but we have done a quite an immersive study, study on the scenario now and the scenario that is going to come. I wish each and every one of you all the very best in, the, in your pursuit of learning yeah, along with the children. And I thank uh, Asma for giving us this opportunity. And I really enjoyed, you know, um, navigating this session with each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Th
uh, past session. So uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, keen to know that what are the challenges that have been faced by the entire uh, eminence or the industry in the education sector of, uh, you know, adopting to the new technology, the entire pandemic situation, how it's been, uh, you know, helping the teachers, the stakeholders, and even the students and the parents in getting adopted to this. So as everybody is, uh, you know, having their own patterns, uh, there, there has been even the patterns in terms of handling the marketing side, the entire uh, journey of students being onboarded, uh, giving the trust factor in the parents that the children are in the very safe hands when they come to the uh, schools for admissions. So this has been a complete, uh, you know, and uh, first ever challenge, I believe, as far as I've come into this industry, that everybody is facing uh, these kind of challenges. So um, how at we or our robotics are helped to adopt to the AI technology and how we can help you automate this entire journey, that is what I would like to uh, cover in this uh, upcoming presentation. Please let me know uh, once my screen is visible to everyone so that uh, I'll be able to take it up. Uh, screen is visible? Yes. So um, well, basically, Ora is an entire AI conversational platform which is going to help in the boarding and the board schools with the entire AI powered capabilities and automated uh, the entire journey using WhatsApp as well. So uh, how is WhatsApp going to help us and what are the details you know uh, that have been required. So the current slide that you're seeing is the entire journey that happens in the boarding school. So be it your pre-admission, during admission and post-admission. So pre-admission is definitely one of the uh, bigger challenges when we talk to our counsellor. The counsellor tells us that okay this was a general query and you know these are the repeated questions that we are facing. And this is where the most of the time is gone in addressing to the very serious things. Right? So once that has been taken care of, how can AI help you in entire during education? So you know, in, uh, entire PDF or the details of the uh, classes starting, the timetables that has been done, what are the events coming up? So this entire journey of the students boarding and the uh, international journey can be taken care of using the AI platform. So uh, I have to introduce the first ever AI marketing and engagement strategy, which is going to help us in uh, uh, eliminating the obstacles uh, which parents and the students basically face. So when I talk about the entire journey, we know as a student, when you think uh, as a point of a student or a parent, parents are very keen to know uh, the factors that are there right, uh, on your screen, like you know, understanding that, okay, my uh, so my child is coming there, so what are the, you know, uh, additional facilities that are available in school, what are, uh, how is, you know, uh, the, the student life, how is the campus, how are the admission assistants? So these are very basic queries that a parent, for a point of a parent view, they are very, very necessary to be taken care of. So how can AI uh, be able to take it up, even considering your marketing journey? So here are a few five stats which will be coming up, which is going to change the entire perspective of using an AI in the uh, marketing side of it. So currently, if you see, 82% of the marketing leaders are planning to adopt to AI, which is going to help in improving the entire customer, parent or the student experience. So when I talk about the entire AI journey, right when a person comes, so the first go-to person, this is like, okay, where can I get in touch with it? All they need to know is they look at the phone number, the phone numbers get connected, not connected, and the entire um, connection with that parent and the end person is missed out. So, and when a person also gets connected from the school side of it, the uh, questions are very basic. So how can we eliminate that? So by using the AI technology, you can have your set up of uh, all the uh, you know pre-admission kind of queries uh, developed, and AI itself will be able to take it up. There is no requirement of a human counselor or a human salesperson to even interfere there because your AI is handling that. So when uh, we talk about the second step, 85 percent of the execution uh, executives believe in using AI, which is definitely helping the productivity of our sales. So when I help about uh, when I talk about productivity of the sales team. Now your sales counselor need to only cater to those who want to come and take the admission in the institution and who need the personal attention. All the entire conversation before that will be taken care by AI. So uh, when we talk about that, even your basic, you know, when, uh, what is the time, when can I get connected, all these basic details, 40% of the consumers are willing to accept to AI chatbots. So there is uh, like, and specifically at the given period of time. 
So, so uh, and the most important, like you know, today's generation or today's parents, what they prefer is like, okay, right now I'm not available for a call, but let's connect via uh, message, right? But our, as humans have their own uh, limitations, we humans cannot uh, cater to a lot of inquiries. So the for, uh, fifth point is basically this consumers which are uh, currently using, uh, when I talk about the messaging application, your AI is going to, you know, get connected to all your uh, messaging application, be it your website, be it your Facebook Messenger application, be it your lead generation advertisements as well, and be it your, you know, assistant as a counselor. So you will have an entire AI virtual con uh, counselor taking care of all your uh, marketing queries, all your during and all the post academic uh, uh, journey. So when I talk about, like when I talk about these factors, I really want to know that what are your thoughts about you know where does your uh, target uh, market lies. So I would uh, uh, request everyone to please put their thoughts in the comments. So the question is like where do you think your targeted segment uh, boarding schools are primarily on? Are they using mobile? Are they using WhatsApp? Are they using Instagram or all of the above factors? Messenger application, the main criteria is we also need to understand where people are spending time. So as we all know and we ourselves, right, uh, during this session, I believe most of us were also connected over the WhatsApp, right? We just said what are the updates going on, how is the, uh, you know, rest of the things taking care. So when I talk about that, 90% of people above 15 plus age group are spending their time over WhatsApp, which is on an average 2 to 3 hours. 90% also people spend their time on Facebook Messenger application to have conversation with each other, knowing how the uh, industry is revolving, what are the things, or sharing each other the post or the recent updates related to the industry. 60% of the people prefer going onto the website where they spend on an average one to two hours to understand the entire entire school, what their facilities are, how are they working, how are they adapting to the new technology. And 10% of the people who check the messaging application uh, uh, on an average two to three hours. We also know we don't even check most of our uh, normal text SMS that must come on our uh, phone. So what defines a successful omni-channel strategy and how can ORI help you with that? Before moving to how ORI can help you, we also need to understand what is omni-channel. So omni-channel is basically in a layman language. How can I connect my website? How can I connect my service support team? How can I connect uh, the marketing collaterals? And how can all the needs or all the support that a parent is looking for, can they come to an, a single channel? Yes, the answer is definitely uh, yes. So using an AI automated tool, all your entire collaterals, all your queries can come to a unified channel wherein all the uh, queries can be taken up and even answered to without any human venture. So uh, childhood des definitely helps us in guiding the uh, engagement of the parents. So, also helps us to understand that you know the parent is not lost it's like okay uh, your student has taken the admission there is uh, so parent doesn't feel that he has lost the connect with the school so how can ai chatbots help you in the outreach the entire pre admission information can be provided by the uh, ai chatbots all your application support so if the, there are any basic queries do i use a black pen do i use a blue pen or where do i submit the form or where is the payment link all these kind of application support can be taken care by ORI. All your marketing integrations, like just I said, to Facebook, your Instagram advertisements, PPC campaigns, your FIFA or uh, other uh, social media platforms can be tightly integrated with ORI. So on campus support, now the parent has come in and they need any you know query that where is the admission department or how can I reach to the admission department. All these kind of queries can also be taken up by uh, your AI assistant. Multilingual sub, uh, support. So one of the best features of ORI is ORI can be integrated as to any local languages as per Google can be done inside the platform and parent can have conversation with the person with respect to uh, their preferred language. Uh, and even the uh, placements as such as scholarship assistant and alumni assistant can be provided using the AI platform. So the uh, screen right in front of you are the quick benefits that ORI brings onto the table go beyond the chatbots. So the entire uh, future you see is the conversational AI and engagement which is over WhatsApp. So trust me like if you ask us, our, uh, ask our age group, the first thing like boyfriend ka message hai WhatsApp hai, we are like first one to see. And any like just a vague example but if you talk about any like uh, I do prefer like no, uh, emails, we hardly check right. If there are any updates on the emails, we hardly check. But there is a sound notification. It's the fastest that we 
uh, uh, currently see in the uh, scenario. So uh, the entire technology and the architecture of the conversational platform, what is Aura I help you? Aura is a conversational AI with a customer digital experience. Aura also has voice, uh, voice capabilities. So if your um, ch uh, child wants to know that, uh, okay, what are my tomorrow uh, you know, schedule or what is my timetable? When are my exams coming up on uh, okay, Google? So Aura has the capabilities to answer uh, these kind of queries using the voice assistant. All the automation, instant support, instant re response, 24 by 7 available over all the messenger applications. And with all these factors, Aura will also help you with the predictive analysis, even letting you know if this query is a hot or a cold or even a win invalid. So our uh, counselors and our school teachers know, okay, these are the people that, you know, we need to cater to first. So when we talk about the entire omni-channel strategy, we also need to re-imagine on the complete omni-channel strategy with ORI. ORI can get integrated to your WhatsApp with the verified green batch and with all, uh, and WhatsApp can become an one single source of the customer engagement through across all your uh, marketing poll activities. So here are uh, the slide which is right in front of you. Here are few verified institution with ORI. Uh, I'm just quickly moving to a 20 seconds video wherein uh, we have the entire uh, uh, a scenario how ORI can help you. The video is right in front of you. Uh, the is one of our trusted clients wherein uh, I just sent a high message wanting to know what are the details at Runga Group of Institutions. You will see uh, it will directly say that uh, you know I am Ria, your virtual counselor, and what are you looking? So I can say that, okay, I'm looking for an admission or I'm not looking for an admission. I can take my query. So it will just quickly ask me, what is my name? So that it can read me. And then the entire conversation will be taken ahead by the entire virtual assistant without any human intervention. So as I fill my details, you will see each and every information related to the group of institution is right in front of me. All I have to do is select my option and go forward. So if I want to know about courses, I can click on courses and get uh, ahead with the courses. For us to understand the needs of the futuristic IB schools and boarding schools uh, in which we uh, uh, look forward for advancement in the parent uh, and the student outreach, which will be able to help the parents reach the uh, school very easily at their given period of time. It will also help engage with the institution or the school it will also help her retain that customer and it uh, gives her uh, entire uh, trust factor with the institution. So with Orion, we have an, uh, one of the best disruption uh, technology adopted. When a customer or a parent is, uh, uh, get, uh, is in, you can send your entire scheduler, your timetables, the upcoming sessions, the upcoming details automatically without any human intervention. All you have to do is just prepare a calendar, upload it and done. All your WhatsApp group campaigns, and these communications can be sent to the parent in or WhatsApp uh, itself. So when we talk about that, so far what happens, right? You know, like uh, now uh, the parent has known uh, known that these are the details, but I want to talk to the teacher. Your entire uh, the teacher can get connected to that parent using the WhatsApp, wherein AI is answering its uh, own question, and a three-way integration can also be done with Oda. So that's all for today from my end. Uh, as uh, Asma has provided us this wonderful opportunity, we are running an offer to all the entire school leadership conflict people. Uh, please, uh, uh, there is a uh, link in the uh, chat section wherein you can just fill up a form. We are uh, giving away 45 days of complete subscription and implementation for free. You can uh, have this technology integrated for your institution and uh, uh, enhance the power of Quran. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, showcasing you the entire presentation. I can see the excitement when you, you know, present uh, the organization and the kind of opportunities and offers what Moi has to you know, bring over here. But this looks very uh, interesting. In fact, we can we have just the discussion in the first panel as well. And couple of last uh, few webinar parts, how collaboration opportunities you know, you know, help the business to grow, develop, and uh, the way the EdTech companies like URI, FMA, people are uh, doing uh, your hard efforts in uh, you know imparting the digital transformation, social media, 
uh, involvement of WhatsApp, conversational, uh, you know, WhatsApp chats. So uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, this is making the life more simpler by involving the different aspects of uh, and uh, you know transforming each and every prospects into conversion, uh, assessing to their examination and so many things, but not. And thank you so much for making this uh, special offer for the audience and the attendees today. Uh, definitely, we will be interested in uh, uh, talking to our this opportunity. Thank you so much for uh, coming and uh, giving this knowledge about what uh, you have uh, Going ahead, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the next panel for the day. In fact, I am feeling very excited, very happy, and very proud as uh, I have this opportunity to introduce the next panel for the day. My one of the favorite panel, which is boarding school. And why I say that? Because um, 12 to 13 years of my life, I was a hostel. Since class 1 to class 12, I have enjoyed the hostel life, and I feel so happy in seeing so that it has you know taught me the discipline it has taught me the self dependence it has taught me how to do how to be multitasker it has taught me to involve yourself into co curricular multi curricular activities it has uh, uh, shown me the way of being a sports sportsman it has uh, uh, taught me how to uh, be a good team player a team worker and the overall holistic development of my life and my career I feel so proud uh, today as uh, uh, I am alumni of uh, one of the school who has been represented by Ms. Bharti Madhav. She is my guru, my teacher, my mentor. I was the alumni of Salim School. Uh, two to three years of my career has uh, gone over there. And what not I have done over there. That was one of the excite, you know, excitement and the best days of my life. Hope these days are uh, uh, back again with a better development and opportunity for the people who have not witnessed and seen the hostel life. So thumbs up to the, the hostel team over here. So to introduce the panel for the day, uh, this uh, panel is going to speak about uh, the future of boarding school during and post pandemic. Let me introduce the eminent speaker. We have Ms. Aditi Gorodia. She is the managing director of Villa Moria High School, very international and very, uh, very beautiful school in a lovely city of Anjigani. Uh, it's a small hill station in Mahabhishwar. Moderating uh, the session today. Thank you so much Adi, for accepting our uh, uh, invitation to moderate this session. Uh, we have uh, with her, uh, we have with her, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dilip George. He is the principal of Toon International School, Riverside Campus from Dehradun. Welcome, uh, Dilip George, sir. Miss Nita Sharma. Miss Nita Sharma, uh, principal of Mas Masuri International School, Masuri. Uh, Mr. Thank Sanjeev Kumar you. Sina, Principal of the Indian Public School, Dehradun. I uh, have this second opportunity, Sanjeev sir, to welcome you as we invited you to one of our uh, previous uh, sessions as well. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bharti Madhu, one of my favorites, Group Director, Sanjeev Guru International, uh, Sanjeev Guru of Educational Institute from Varanasi. Ma'am, thank you for accepting our opportunity to, uh, you know, coming us again in this panel discussion. And Shankar Singh of Adhikari, he is the Principal of Rajkumar College from Rajkumar. Over to you, Aditi. Thank you so much, Chandan. It's so good to be here as always. And I'm so, so glad you brought this panel on boarding schools together. It's not often that uh, we get to talk about residential schools and, and the magic we do on our campus. Um, so it's a great opportunity for us to uh, have a dialogue and pass some myths as well. So uh, to begin with, uh, boarding schools have been around for centuries. Uh, from the earliest gurukuls to the British era when modern education became synonymous to uh, what we now call legacy schools across the country. And, and some of the leaders sitting here right now are the leadership of these legacy institutes. And I'm totally getting goosebumps moderating this right now. <laughs> so, um, so it's an absolute honor. Uh, thank you all the panelists for being here and uh, to come here to have a dialogue about the future of boarding schools uh, across India. Um, these are schools that have been nurturing and raising independent individuals from across the globe, as you said, uh, Chandan, about your own childhood. And I say the words independent and globe with a lot of emphasis here, because uh, these are the fundamental values or principles of a residential school. This is what each one of us builds upon, um, independence and you know, global citizens. Um, 
Now, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the situation that has ensued, we get to hear about schools closing and online classes, hybrid learning, progressive learning, NEP. But where do boarding schools stand uh, in this entire scenario? Uh, we have our own unique struggles, our own concerns, and our own unique solutions. Uh, will we survive is something I get to hear quite a bit lately. Uh, and we will bust that myth with the conversation. Are we safer for children now since the exposure levels once they come to our campuses will be limited or almost zero? Uh, and most importantly, what's the plan going forward? Where do we go from here? So without further delay, let's hear from uh, these wonderful school leaders here. To begin with, let's address the most pressing query of current times, which is the pandemic. Residential schooling goes much beyond academics. We do a lot of co-curriculars, uh, a lot of wholesome learning. So let's hear about the challenges that each one of us face this year. How are your schools working with your parents to ensure wholesome learning continues, even in the virtual format? Um, and I think as for the uh, uh, little creative that you showed me, Mr. George, we can start with you. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, it has been a you know, quick change, I would say, from the normal going back into the typical classroom sessions. But I think, you know, most of us have been able to uh, adapt to it much quickly. For us also, it was a bit of a challenge with the school closing towards the end of March and, you know, the lockdown coming in and then to continue with the academic session. But yes, I think the transition was a little bit smooth uh, and the school management was very supportive in uh, taking some steps. Uh, in investing in certain you know technology so we happen to introduce a learning management system which is a single platform for all the teaching learning activities which happen and it's a very user friendly platform so you know the students the parents the teachers i think everyone was able to move into this new system uh, seamlessly uh, to an extent that we are also able to conduct our online activities online competitions so more or less whatever was scheduled in our calendar only difference is that it has just become virtual. But otherwise, I think the togetherness, uh, you know, when it comes to the assemblies, when it comes to the classes, competitions, all these things have, uh, you know, set in well now, now in this new uh, situation. So I think that's that's the transformation that we have taken. Uh, but I think there was no other choice, but everyone has to adopt to this particular situation. Interesting uh, that even your assemblies have continued, uh, as well as I think uh, apart from sports, most of us have been able to continue uh, co-curriculars and events. So uh, moving over to Ms. Sharma, um, how about things at Masuri International? Your unique audience. Yeah, thank you. More or less, I do agree with uh, what George has just said. Um, you know, there was no choice. You were, we were forced into this transition. And uh, not that everybody was very, very tech savvy. I mean, people um, knew technology, but to kind of conduct classes uh, was really not their forte online. But uh, there was no choice. People were forced, and they actually reinvented themselves on the job. So they just you know, went on from becoming better and better from their previous days, and the classes went on becoming smoother. Um, so we've been doing a lot. We've even done a lot of United Nations um, online. We have, uh, you know, conducted sessions called ABCD where anybody can draw, which were open sessions. We went on doing a lot of co-curricular activities because, in a sense, you're very right when you say that uh, a boarding school is much beyond academics. And to uh, retain the true essence of a boarding school, um, one really has to do those extra things. Um, you know, which are beyond a day school. So uh, academics, you know, so a boarding school does academics, but it's really, really not an academic school. It does academics very well. But frankly speaking, we are not purely an academic school. So we went on to do a lot of these kind of activities. What I felt was that despite all the effort that was put in, I am sure there will be huge learning gaps 
when my girls come back to school, right? And there would also be certain gaps in their social emotional development. You know, they have been confined to their own homes. They have um, kind of uh, just stayed within those four walls. Uh, and very interestingly, that is probably the reason why the stats say that the kids in that range suffer less because the kids have been so protected and so kept at home that it is really ambiguous, those stats. Had those kids been moving out like adults, probably the stats would have been much higher. Right? So, the, uh, the, uh, the staying at home um, has also probably in some cases led to a better understanding between the parent and the child of a boarding school, which slowly and steadily somewhere um, does suffer because of the distance um, and it becomes like the second hand kind of a relation. In the first hand parents end up becoming the school people and they align more to the ideology, more to the thought process, more to the openness and the international mindedness of the school than their own parents. So somewhere I feel that probably either they have taught all of that to their parents while being at home. <laughs> We can only hope. For <laughs> the very best. But um, so there would be differences even in their emotional levels of growth. Um, though they have been together on those classes, online virtual platforms. But um, the physical interaction, the group dynamics that happens, the body language, the facial process,
Gift.
because there is so much we can offer that play schools cannot. Uh, we have large. Campus.